Welcome back, nerds. Today we are going to finish our foray into logarithms, at least the very beginning. We're still talking about what even a logarithm is, right? I mean, we've only covered one section, and so far what we've learned is that logarithms are the inverses of exponentials, and exponentials are the inverses of logarithms. So logarithms are the way that we cancel exponential bases as long as the log base matches the exponential base. We did a little bit of manipulating out of logarithmic format to get it into exponential format, getting it out of exponential format into logarithmic format, and we ended with a couple, actually I got all three of them done in one of the other classes, but some evaluating questions, and that's what you guys were doing on the extra credit, at least the first 15 questions was evaluating logarithms, right? You might have noticed in the homework that there's only two questions on evaluating logarithms. That was because I knew I was leaving you the extra credit and I didn't feel like giving you a bunch of extra questions because, you know, I feel like 17 of them is pretty good to be asking you to do in class or at home. We'll do more tomorrow while we're practicing. I'll try to come up with some really hard ones tomorrow. But today, we're going to talk about word problems. Eek! That's right, words. Luckily, you all read English. Afterwards, we'll get into graphing. The energy released by an earthquake can be determined by this equation, E equals 10 to the 4.4 times 10 to the 1.5 M, where capital E is the energy released in joules, that's a measurement of energy, and capital M is the magnitude of the earthquake. Our first job is to write an equation that finds the magnitude based on the energy. Essentially, solve for M. That's the first job. We're going to solve for M. And then so we have an equation that solves for M, we'll have magnitude equals some stuff. And we will then be able to find the magnitude with this gigantic amount of energy. Okay. So first thing we're going to do, solve for M. E equals 10 to the 4.4 times 10 to the 1.5 M. There. We're trying to get M alone. So you look at it and you go, oh, M is up in the exponent position. No big deal. I learned how to cancel exponential bases. I'll just see log base 10 on both sides. Well, not exactly. And here's why. You can't cancel this exponential base 10 until it's alone. Just like you couldn't cancel absolute value bars until they're alone, you can't cancel a square root bar until it's alone. We need to get the thing alone before we can cancel it. And that'll be true for logarithms as well. Never canceling a structure till it's lonely. So we can get this thing here alone two different ways. Way number one, which is not the way I want to do, but would still work. We could divide both sides by this exponential statement, 10 to the 4.4, because that is a number. It doesn't have a variable in it, it's 10 to the 4.4. Then we could use log base 10 on both sides. Okay, well, the only issue with that, and it really isn't a true issue, is that you'd have a fraction inside your logarithm and the bottom of that fraction would have an exponential statement. Well, whatever, we're gonna use a calculator anyway. I mean, I guess the real thing about it that I don't like is that it's not pretty. It doesn't feel elegant. My preferred way of getting exponential base 10 alone on the right side is noticing that these two things have the same exponential base. This is me multiplying two numbers with the same base. And when you multiply two numbers with the same base, what do you do with their exponents? You add them, yeah. So we can write this as e to the, or e equals, excuse me, 10 to the 1.5m plus 4.4. And now exponential base 10 is alone. See if you guys remember my script. Hey class, what cancels exponential base 10? Log base 10. Log base 10, yeah. Some people forgot, but a lot of you were still there. So we're going to use log base 10 on both sides of this equation. On the right side, log base 10 and exponential base 10 cancel each other out like that. <clears throat> that leaves us with this equation. Log base 10 of E equals 1.5 M plus 4.4. 4. 
Now it's an Algebra 1 question, get m by itself. We need to subtract 4.4. I said subtract, and I wrote equals again. <clears throat> and then lastly, divide both sides by 1.5 to isolate m. And it's going to give me m equals log e minus 4.4 over 1.5. Uh, yeah, Thomas, what's up? Oh, where'd the base 10 go? Shucks. Oops. Or, time to let a cat out of bag. The authors of our textbook didn't want you to know this yet. I don't know why. But, on your calculator, you've got a button that says log. And you'll notice right above it, it says 10 to the x. That means those are inverse operations. Guess what log means? No, log means log base 10. You actually don't have to write a base if the base is 10. You know how we don't write the little 2 on a square root, but we all know the index is a 2 because it's the most common root type? This is literally called the common log. Log of something means log base 10. So let's go ahead and write that up at the top. Log x means log base 10 of x. So that's what the log button on your calculator does. It's log base 10. It is the most common logarithm. It's the one that gets used probably 95% of the time outside of a math classroom. It's the one that gets used all the time in the real world. Uh, Richter scale is logarithmic. pH scale is logarithmic. And these are all like base 10 type things. Uh, intensity of light, intensity of sound. All of these things are like log base 10. They're all base 10 things. <clears throat> so yeah, I didn't write it on purpose because it means the same thing. From now on, if you just see log, you know that that means base 10, okay? I'll probably still use it until I teach you the common, like teach the common log in its official lesson, but I actually wanted you to know ahead of time because you can't do the second part of this question unless you know that log base 10 means just press the log button on this calculator. Because the second part of this question wants to know what the magnitude is when this is E. We have to plug it in. So you have to know how to use the calculator for it. The magnitude of this earthquake is log of, and I'll even use parentheses because this is a big old number, 501-187-233-627 joules. I'll subtract 4.4 from that logarithm, and I will divide by 1.5. If you're using the battery operating calculator, you have to type the 501 billion number first, then press log afterwards. But for this calculator, it's just log and then that number. Clear. Close up my parentheses. So that's a big old number. But log base 10 of that number, not so bad. Subtract the 4.4, and then divide by 1.5. Earthquake magnitudes, as far as I know, are only rounded, they're rounded only to one decimal. So we'd call that a 4.9 earthquake. Four point nine magnitude. Some people in first period, and I'm sure they weren't alone, some people in first period thought that that was a remarkably strong earthquake. It's actually not. The Richter scale goes all the way up to 10, theoretically. It does not stop at 5 like our hurricanes do. Okay, uh, So a magnitude 5 earthquake is like, whoa, that was really shaky. You know, Maybe some drywall cracked. Windows might have broke a little bit, but it's not catastrophic unless it hits a third world country. If it hits like in California or something, they, you know, they take a nap through a 5.0. Okay? <clears throat> but there it is. Do you feel like you could isolate a variable using inverse properties of logarithms? Okay, just following SADMEP. The only trick was combining these two. Like I said, I could have just divided. That would have worked out also. It would have had a completely different looking equation, but we would have got the same answer at the end. And that's okay also, yeah. 
Oh, I wrote equals by accident when it was supposed to say minus. So I just scribbled it out as I was subtracting 4.4 .4 to the left. We good? No questions? We sure? Okay. All right. Because you got, what, two word problems in your homework? Okay. All righty. Hopefully you don't think they're any harder than that. So let's get into what's really important for today, the real meat and potatoes of the lesson. Oh, we still writing? Good? Okay. Graphing. There are two parent logarithmic functions. Reason why is because there are two parent exponential functions. I'm just going to look for a piece of scrap paper and draw them out for you, but hopefully you remember there's exponential growth, which looks like that. And there's exponential decay, which looks like this reflected over the y-axis, so it comes down and to the right like that. This logarithm is the inverse function of the exponential growth function. We don't call this a growth logarithm or anything like that. I'm just telling you it is the inverse of the one that goes up and to the right. This one is the inverse of the one that comes down and to the right, like that. Just like the parent exponential, if the exponential base is greater than 1, it goes up and to the right. If the logarithmic base is greater than 1, it goes up and to the right. So it's the exact same setup. Base is greater than 1. Base is greater than 1. If an exponential base is between 0 and 1, you have a decay graph. This is that graph flipped over the line y equals x. We don't call it a decay. It just is a logarithm. It just happens to be the inverse of an exponential decay graph. But you know what is interesting? Is these the same image, except this one's upside down. And what kind of transformation typically makes things upside down? A reflection. What, where? Negative sign on the X or negative sign on the front? front? On the front. That's interesting. It's almost like if the base is a fraction between 0 and 1, it's the same as if I had just said reflect this over the x-axis, which puts a negative on the front. Very interesting. We'll revisit that when we get into the real serious properties of logarithms later in the chapter. So let's talk about features. Most importantly of all, the domain. The domain of every parent logarithm is from 0 to infinity. And here's why. The range of the parent exponential is from 0 to infinity. And finding an inverse just has you switch x and y, which means you're switching the domain and the range. So this thing's domain, excuse me, this thing's range, which is from 0 to infinity, is this thing's domain from 0 to infinity. The exponential's domain is all real numbers. The logarithm's range is all real numbers. The exponential has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So the inverse has a vertical asymptote at x equals 0. Continuous just means there's no gaps in the graph. At least that's what it means at this level. Just like the exponential function, there is no symmetry. Just like the exponential function, there is no local max or local minimum. Now, because the range of this is all real numbers, this is unbounded. However, the parent exponential is bounded below. It just is. That's a, that's a feature of the range. It doesn't have a horizontal asymptote because its range is all real numbers, but it does have a vertical asymptote because its domain, domain begins at zero. Now, if you remember when we were graphing exponentials, I found three things. Asymptote and two coordinates. Guess what you need in order to graph a logarithm? Three things. The asymptote and two coordinates. That's really all you need. Now you'll notice that both images have all three coordinates on them that I put on the parent uh, exponential functions, but it's not a big deal. Do you remember how the parent exponential always goes through zero comma one? Remember that? Because b to the zero always equals one. Hey, look what the parent logarithms always go through. 1 comma 0. 
because the x and the y have switched. This one goes through one comma base. This one goes through base comma one. And those two things are actually going to be the points that I hunt for when I graph them. So let's graph a very simple untransformed parent logarithm graph. The first thing that you want to do is you want to track down your domain. The domain tells you at least two different things. The domain is the argument of a logarithm must be positive. I think we talked about that on Thursday. The argument must be positive. So the first thing we do is figure out what allows our argument to remain positive. Our argument is just the letter X this time. So it's literally saying X is greater than zero. That tells you your domain. Your domain is from zero to infinity. And it tells you what your vertical asymptote is going to be. It's where the domain begins, but does not include. And I don't know if you can call it a third bit of information, but if I'm going from zero to infinity, am I going to the left or going to the right? right, right. Going to the right. So this has also kind of told me which direction my graph points. It goes to the right because I'm going from zero to infinity. Awesome. Oh, asymptote at x equals zero. I'm going to throw that guy on there. There you go. Graph will not encounter that. It'll get close to it, infinitely close, but it won't encounter it. Two coordinates. Those two coordinates are going to come from our knowledge of the two special logarithms that are on the bottom of this page. That log base b of 1 always equals 0. Log base b of b always equals 1. I'm going to write them again. It's a hair on my pen. Log base b of 1 always equals 0. Log base b of b always equals 1. Because those two special logarithms are what we are going to try to force to occur in every log graph. So for the first coordinate, and when I say the first, I mean the first pretty coordinate as it, the graph leaves its asymptote. We figure out what is going to make our argument equal 1, because that's going to make this happen. If our argument wasn't just x, we'd have to do a little bit of math. But our argument is just x. So we go, oh, x equals 1. Cool. That means we're going to have a pretty point when x equals 1. We just need to know the y value. So you plug it in. But what does log base 2 of 1 equal? Remember, this says what power of 2 gets you a 1? What exponent always gets you a 1? Zero. The 0 power. Look, guys, it was this. Log base b of 1 always equals 0, no matter what you do, because it says what power of 2 gets me a 1? The 0 power gets me a 1. 2 to the 0 is 1. And that means that this graph has a coordinate at 1, 0. The next thing we want to do is we want to make the argument equal to base because we are forcing the other special logarithm. Our base is 2. So we go, what would have made the argument equal to? Oh, that's right. The argument was just x. So really simple. x equals 2 is going to be the next pretty point. And we need a y value that goes along with it. So we say y equals log base 2 of 2. But what power of 2 gets me a 2? The 1 power does. So this is the coordinate 2 comma 1. Anyone want to take a guess at what the next x value I'd want to plug in would be? Four. Four. How'd you know that? Uh, 
because it's the power because it's a power of the base. You see what we're doing here is we're making the argument equal powers of the base. This is the zero power of the base, the first power of the base, then we'd go for the second power of the base, which would be four, the third power of the base, which would be eight, so on and so forth. So if I wanted to get more and more coordinates, I could say, all right, four, log base two of four. What power of two gets me a four? The second power does. Eight. What power of two gets me eight? The third power does. Oops, I put it on seven. The third power does. And if I wanted to really have fun with it, what power of two gets me a one half? Negative one does. And two to the negative two is one fourth and two to the negative three is one eighth, so on and so forth. So it's really not that bad when the base is relatively close to one. And it's really not that bad when there's no transformations. But here is the overall, we will always follow this setup way for graphing all logarithms. The first thing that we're gonna do is figure out our domain, which means you're asking yourself, what would make the inside equal zero? which is why I set my argument as to greater than zero. So you basically go, all right, argument greater than zero. This is gonna give me my domain and it's gonna help me find the asymptote. Then you're gonna figure out what's going to make your argument equal one. Every single time, you plug in that X to get a Y. Then you'll figure out what makes your argument equal base, which is what we do right there. You do that every single time. You plug it in to get Y. And if you want more coordinates, you're welcome to find more. Simply plug in powers, plug in whatever you have to plug in to make the argument equal base to a power. So it's whatever you have to plug in to make the argument equal that. Because remember, the argument won't always be x. It could be shifted, it could be reflected, it could have some stuff going on, okay? Would you like to ask me any questions about this process? I'm here to answer them. And I'm hoping that you're seeing how remarkably similar this process is to graphing exponentials. We found the asymptote by looking for the horizontal uh, excuse me, the vertical shift. Remember that? Whatever that number was added to the end, we said was always the, the horizontal asymptote of an exponential. That's because it was supposed to be at zero. The logarithm's asymptote is also supposed to be at zero, just x equals zero. So all you have to do is look at the left-right shift. And then I always said, hey, what's going to make the exponent equal zero? Because that made for easy things. And then I said, what makes the exponent equal one? because that made for easy things. It's the exact same process. I've just switched the X's and Y's. What'd you think? Okay. Well, you guys are just looking at me, so I'm gonna turn the page. And we are going to do one that has four, count them, four, one, two, three, four transformations. So yeah, this logarithm is all over the place. It would be great if you had a knowledge of the transformations that you understood that if you just took your parent up into the right logarithm, it's now upside down, grows twice as fast, has shifted left four and down one. Because that knowledge is enough to at least whittle a multiple choice question down to two options. Then you're plugging in one of the X comma Y's that you see it go through and you pick the correct answer. But what if you have to graph it by hand, right? What if you're, it's all on your own at home, doing your homework, you got to graph this thing. You follow that box that we just did on the other side. First thing you do is figure out what is going to make your argument remain positive because the argument of a logarithm must be positive. So we say X plus four is greater than zero to make sure that it's a positive number. You subtract the four from both sides to get that X must be greater than negative four. We know our domain, and we know our vertical asymptote now.
So throw that dotted asymptote right on x equals negative 4. Boom. And we know it's going to the right because it says greater than. So that's why you've got all this space over here. So far, so good? Yes? If the x or argument is greater than 0. Well, because the argument is all of this. And we don't know what this number is unless we know what x is. So we're have, what we're saying is, what are all the x's I'm allowed to use that would guarantee that adding 4 still gets me a positive number? And that's why we could say, hey, anything bigger than negative 4, like you want to use negative 3? Go for it. Because negative 3 plus 4 is still positive, and you're allowed to do that. So that's what we're trying to do. We're guaranteeing that the inside remains positive. Okay? And speaking of negative 3, you know, one of the things that I told you that you want to do is figure out what makes the argument equal 1. Well, let's see. We go x plus 4 equals 1. Subtract 4 from both sides. Oh, look, x equals negative 3 is going to make my argument equal 1. But we need to know the y value associated with x equals negative 3. Here is me dropping in x equals negative 3. Slightly different color. It's green. Well, negative 3 plus 4 is 1. Oh, look. Log base 3 of 1. Just going to remind you of the rule. What does log base b of 1 always equal? Zero. Zero, because everything to the 0 power is 1. So this actually says negative 2 times 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. We now have a coordinate, negative 3, negative 1. Now we need to know what makes our argument equal to base, because we're going to use the other special logarithm to get easy values out of that logarithmic expression. Remember, most logarithmic expressions are irrational, but very specific ones will return pretty values. Now we need to make sure our argument equals our base. Our argument is x plus 4, and our base is 3. Subtract a 4 from both sides. Okay, we have another pretty point that is going to occur at x equals negative 1. We need its y value, though. See, we are engineering the special logarithms to show up. We had one here, and now we have one here. What does log base 3 of 3 equal? Equals 1. Because it says, what power of 3 equals 3? The first power does. So this is just negative 2 minus 1, which is negative 3. That gives us another coordinate at negative 1 comma negative 3. It is a 100% complete coincidence, for those of you that are always looking for shortcuts that don't exist, that these are transposed. That is a coincidence. Okay? Don't think that that's a thing. Please. It's not. And there it is. That's more than enough to see what this graph looks like. It's going to come down and to the right, like that. You want more coordinates? Fine! Set the argument equals base squared. 
set the argument equal to 9. You can do that if you wanted to. Because the base squared, if, if you set this argument equal to 9, you get x equals 5. So at 5, log base 3 of 9 is 2. Gives me negative 2 times 2 minus 1. That's 5 comma negative 5. But you don't need to. You don't need to. You just could. So I'm going to do this. Look, I almost hit 5 negative 5 by accident. Ilya, you had a question a second ago. What's up? Well, what's negative 2 times 0? And what's 0 minus 1? Ta-da. Yep. As long as you know that log base 3 of 1 equals 0. You just do the multiplication before you do the addition and subtraction. Yes, sir? Um, no. You mean right here? No, because PIMDAS tells us we have to clean up inside of parentheses first. Okay. So we have to figure out what's going on in the inside, and then we're allowed to try to evaluate. Okay, but then what happens to log base 3? Log base 3 of 1 is this 0 right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, it is 0 because of this rule. Okay. So this is log base 3 of 1 equaling 0. And then right here was log base b of b equaling 1 because the base and the argument matched. So that gave me this thing right here. Good questions. We got any more? Nada? Okay. If I can ask you to graph from an equation, then you should be able to give me an equation from a graph, and you should be able to use your transformations knowledge to pull that off. Look how important these transformations are that you learned in Algebra 1. They're so important. Here's what I'm telling you. f of x is log base 4 of x. And g of x is a version of log base 4 of x. We just need to figure out what transformations occurred that are going to give us this equation. Okay, someone tell me something they notice right off the bat comparing the two graphs to each other. There's a reflection over what axis? Well, this is the x-axis. You, your, your question had a... I mean, your answer had a question mark on it. If I take this graph and I flip it over the x-axis, do I get this graph? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -mm. It's reflected over the y-axis. Remember, reflecting over the x-axis turns the graph upside down. But this is backwards, so it's reflecting over the x-axis. Okay. So we're going to say reflect over x-axis. How do we recognize reflecting over the x-axis? Ah, oh, crap. I, you said x, I said x. The answer is y. Look what you did to me. I blame you. It's all your fault. Uh, anyway, reflecting over the y-axis, how do we recognize that in the equation? What do we always see, Thomas? Where? There's a negative sign on the x. So we know there's a negative x inside. We know that right now. For sure there's a negative x inside. Yes, sir? So if, if it's outside, it's, uh, it's over the uh, y-axis? Well, if it's outside, it's over the x-axis because it's a y change. Oh, okay. I know. That's so weird to say, right? Yeah, if it's outside, it makes the graph upside down. If it's inside, it makes the graph backwards. So we already know that there's a negative x on the inside. So if we took this f of x... It reflected over the y-axis, it's over here now. Then what would I have to do? Maybe it'd help you if you saw this. That's the asymptote at x equals 2. But if you're looking at our graphing questions... How are we always identifying the asymptote? What did it do for us in our equations? Well, just look here. What did the asymptote do to the inside? What's negative 4 plus 4? 
zero. Look. Setting the argument equal to zero is always going to get you your asymptote. So here's what we know. Our asymptote is that x equals two. That means plugging in x equals two gets us zero. All right, let's, uh, let's go ahead and, so far we know that this is our inside, right? Right now our inside is negative x. Let's plug in two to this. What else is gonna have to be in there so that it equals zero? Here's what I did for those of you, once again, we said this was our inside so far. It was a negative x, like this is what we had. Right now we've got a negative x and we maybe got some other stuff, right? This is inside our log base four. Right now that's what we know because it's back because it's backwards, right? We know there's an asymptote at x equals two. So we know that plugging in two to this makes the inside equal zero. So negative two and some stuff equals zero. What's the other stuff? Positive two. So there's clearly a positive two also on the inside. Our argument is negative x plus two or two minus x. Either way, it gets us the same result. It gets us a negative sign in front of our x and plugging in a positive two gets us a zero. These two things are exactly the same. All we need now because we finished all the horizontal stuff. We've got a horizontal reflection and a horizontal shift. All we need to do now is identify how the closest point to the to f of x asymptote ends up at this closest point for g of x to the asymptote. We've already handled all the horizontal stuff. How are we going to make this point land there? Shift up. How much? Three. We're ready for our equation. Here, I need a good color to use. You know, I use black. Here is g of x. g of x is log base four of. You guys want to say negative x plus two or two minus x? I don't care. Two minus, two minus x. All right, I like that. And then plus three because it shifted up three. There it is. It's done. And that was all based on transformations. I can see that it's going to point left. I can see that plugging in a positive two gets a zero on the inside. And I can see that this point was shifted up three. And there it is. That's all you'd have to do. And if you weren't sure, you could always test your answer using another pretty point, like negative two. Let's see what happens if we plug in negative two. Two minus negative two is two plus two. That puts a four here. Log base four of four equals what? Huh? Log base four of four equals what class? One. one and one plus three is four. Hey, look, it worked out. So that's how we know our answer is correct. We just check another point. Lots of heads down and lots of silence. Hmm. Scary. Okay. And lastly, without a calculator, deciding how the two logarithms are related to each other. Which one's larger or are they the same? Okay, and that's without a calculator. I don't know what any of these six numbers actually are. I don't know, that's not a lie. I have no way of knowing unless I was the biggest nerd on the planet. And the reason why is because none of the arguments are powers of the base, which means I have no clue what any of these equal. Well, I don't know about no clue. I could generally size them up like this. Look, I know 15 is not a power of 2, but what number is a power of 2 that's really close to this? 16. Can we agree that log base 2 of 15 is smaller than log base 2 of 16? Okay. And if this was a 16 right here, log base 2 of 16 says what power of 2 gets me a 16? Fourth power. We just said this was smaller than that, right? So this number right here, whatever that number is, is smaller than four. 
It's close to four. It is, but it's smaller than four. It's less than four. I had no idea that was the number. That's actually the first time today I've typed it on a calculator. 28 is not a power of three, but what power of three is close to 28? 27. If this, can we agree that this number is bigger than log base three of 27? Okay, what power of three gets me a 27? Three. This number is a little bit larger than three. So which number is bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right? The one on the left that's a little bit lower than four is a larger number because it is only a little bit lower than four and this one's only a little bit bigger than three. That guarantees that the number on the left is the bigger number. Again, I don't know what log base three of 28 is. but I do know it's smaller than 3.9. See, it's darn near three. It's just a little bit larger than three. This one was darn near four, just a little bit less than four. That means this number is bigger. And that's without knowing what the numbers actually equal. Okay, 10 is not a power of three. What number is a power of three that's close to this? Nine. nine. And what does log base three of nine equal? Two. Two. Is this number bigger than two or smaller than two? This is just a little bit bigger than two because log base three of 10 is clearly bigger than log base three of nine and log base three of nine equals two because what well, power of three gets me a nine? The second power does. <clears throat> 60 is not a power of four. What number is a power of four that's close to this though? 64. This number is smaller than log base four of 64. But what does log base four of 64 equal? Three. So this number is a little bit less than three. So which one's bigger, the number on the left or the number on the right? The number on the right is bigger. Because this one's only a little bit bigger than two, this one's only a little bit less than three, this is the bigger number now. Last one. Five is not a power of two, but what power of two is close to this? Four. The number four. And is this bigger or smaller than log base two of four? Bigger. It is bigger. What is log base two of four equal? Two. two. So you guys said this is bigger. So this number is just a little bit bigger than two. What power of four is close to this number? 16 is. Can we agree, uh, log base four of 15, bigger or smaller than log base four of 16? Smaller. smaller. What is log base four of 16? Two. two, so this number is smaller than two. So what's bigger, left or right? Left is bigger. Look at you nerds, estimating sizes of logarithms with no calculators, big old juicy brains. <laughs>